Hey guys, this is John, and this is a review of my round three game from the Twin Ports Open in Duluth, Minnesota. This event took place back in August, but I've been slowly reviewing the games on my channel, emphasis on slowly. And as you may recall, I started out 2-0 in this event. I won my first two games. If you missed the videos for those games, they're in the description below. And in this game, I faced women's grandmaster Camilla Bagenskite, USCF rating of 2277, the highest rated player I had faced so far in the event. And I had the black pieces. Time control was game in 90 with a 30 second increment. And even though I was black here facing a master, I was looking to strike for sure. In a short tournament like this, it was only five rounds. You got to gather the points quickly. And there were some other strong players in the event, so I knew that they were going to be posting big scores as well. So you got to try to win with black. So Camilla opened with d4. I replied with d5. She played the queen's gambit, c4. I played c6, the Slav. This is my usual. Now she surprised me a little bit. And I had a bit of time to prepare for this game, and I saw in the database that she had played this next move before, but I was not expecting it because she had played it many years ago, and it seemed to me it was like very specific preparation for a certain opponent. But she took on d5, as opposed to playing the usual knight f3 or knight c3. So this is the exchange Slav, white capturing on d5. And it's a pesky line for black to face because white is playing for, usually, a safe, solid position with an extra tempo and a symmetrical setup. So whenever your opponent is doing that and you're black, it's difficult to strive for anything other than equality because uh, playing in a symmetrical fashion is usually going to minimize the risk for the first player. And the first player is going to be controlling the action, at least for the foreseeable future. Theoretically, black is not in any danger in the exchange slav, but in the past I have struggled against this line. And I'm surprised I don't play this line for white, actually. I've been meaning to incorporate this into my white game because it's right up my alley. So I think this was a smart choice on Camilla's part. She doesn't play like a ton of tournament chess, although relative to me, she probably plays about the same amount or maybe even more. So maybe in this game, she was just looking to control the play early on with this capture. So here she played knight c3. I played knight f6 in reply, bishop f4. Very often the knights all come out to the center in this line, so white could play knight f3 and black could respond with knight c6 here. That's a launching point for a number of variations. But Camilla decides to play bishop f4, which is also a trendy line. And with bishop f4, white might keep open the option of playing e3, bishop d3, and then knight ge2. So it's trying to send the knight to a different square than the usual f3 post. Now black could play knight c6 all the same here, but I decided to play a move that I've had success with in the past, queen b6. So an early queen development, hitting the pawn on b2. And I was hoping that the effect of this move is that white would become confused and waste time defending the b2 pawn, which when I played this queen b6 move in the past has often been the case. So I've seen players play queen d2, queen b3, even rook b1, which is definitely not a good move in view of bishop f5. But your first instinct, if you don't know this line, as white is to defend the b2 pawn. And I think if white does that, black is pretty happy. For instance, queen d2, I had a game one time that went knight c6, hitting the d4 pawn, e3, bishop f5, and black had an easy plan, e6, bishop b4 if allowed, and knight e4. So the early queen development will have proved its worth. But Camilla knew what she was doing. She played e3, just reinforcing the pawn on d4, getting ready to develop the light square bishop, and challenging me to take the pawn on b2. So now queen takes b2 is definitely the critical move here. However, I was not comfortable with the resulting complications and mainly not comfortable with my knowledge of how the game should continue. I knew that after queen takes b2, the critical line was bishop b5 check, bishop d7, bishop takes d7, knight b takes d7, and now knight ge2. And I recall analyzing this a few years ago and deciding that white has pretty good compensation. And I think the engine even says the same thing, that uh, white has a lot of play for the pawn. And based on the speed with which she played e3, I thought it would be kind of foolish to take the pawn on b2, like maybe she has looked at this line in depth. This is the psychology that often happens in chess. You just have to make a judgment call at the board, like how much does your opponent know versus how much do you know and what level of risk you're willing to take on. So I chickened out here a little bit and did not take the pawn on b2, but I played a reasonable move. I played bishop g4, attacking the queen on d1. 
Camilla played bishop b5 check, so an in-between move. Knight c6, just blocking. Queen takes b5 is not a good idea. After knight takes b5, bishop takes d1. I don't think there's any reason to give white a chance to play knight c7 check and go after my rook in the corner. So I'm not going to venture into that line. So knight c6, just blocking. Queen out to b3. The next several moves look very normal for both sides. So I don't have too many comments on them. e6, knight ge2, bishop e7, castles, castles. However, from here, I think Camilla managed to get a slight advantage. So I'm kind of wondering if despite playing very standard moves, both sides just completing their development, if I somehow erred in this sequence. I know that right around here, the engine was claiming I should take on e2 and voluntarily trade my bishop for the knight. So I may have to go back and investigate that, but you'll see what I mean over the course of the next few moves. Camilla is able to develop an initiative. So after mutual castling, she played knight a4, hitting my queen on b6. I played queen a5. And now rook fc1. And I think this is the correct rook to use. The action is taking place on the queen side here. And I don't think leaving the rook on f1 is going to achieve much for white. That is, if white played rook ac1 instead. So whereas this rook on a1 proves to be handy in the game for her. So rook fc1, attacking my knight on c6 twice. And here I decided to play in aggressive fashion, or dynamic fashion, let's say. I could just defend this knight, so I definitely considered rook fc8, just holding it. But instead I, I decided on knight b4. So removing the threat of bishop takes c6, and threatening white's bishop. So now queen takes b5. Camilla continued with, whoa, did not mean to do that, I'm sorry. <laughs> I skipped to the end of the game. I hit the down arrow instead of the right arrow. So knight b4, uh, knight ec3 was played. This defends the bishop on b5 and also prepares the bishop to come back to f1 if it gets attacked. Now white's knights are a little clumsy here, but I'm not able to take advantage of that. I did play a6 attacking the bishop, but she just retreated the bishop all the way to f1 as planned. And here I kind of continued the, the thrust of my plan that I embarked on with knight b4 a couple moves ago. I played b5, so advancing and attacking that knight on a4. She responded with knight c5. I traded on c5, and then played my knight back to c6. So now we're getting into the middle game, and some imbalances have been introduced to the position. White has the bishop pair, whereas I have one more central pawn. And white has this pawn on c5, which... It's open to debate so far as to whether this is a strength or a weakness for white. I, as black, am hoping to prove that this is a weakness and that it's overextended compared to white's other pawns and white's pieces may not have a good chance to defend it. Whereas she will attempt to prove that this is a useful pawn. And especially if she's able to achieve a3 followed by b4, establishing a protected pass pawn on c5, she may win that minor argument. So after knight c6, Camilla played h3 attacking my bishop. I played bishop f5. And here's, here's where things got sharp. So I haven't asked you a question yet this game, but I know some of you like it when I pose you questions throughout the course of analysis. So white to move. See if you can find a dynamic idea for white that puts pressure on black's position. This is not something to win material, but see if you can find a continuation that will introduce some level of um, dynamicism to the position that is going to give me issues to solve as black. And you can pause your video if you like. Okay, so the coming idea is pretty cool. And I did see it during the game. I did anticipate that this could happen. And I thought there was a chance she would go for it. And indeed, she played a4, attacking my pawn on b5. I like this decision for white because with the pair of bishops, white should strive to open the position. So make pawn exchanges, create as many open lines as possible for the bishops to show their might. And also, if I'm going to attack this pawn on c5 as black, I'm kind of hoping that the structure stays closed. So with a4, white is able to introduce uh, another piece to help defend that pawn, namely the rook on c1, with a, a cool idea, you'll see. So a4... I don't think I can really take this pawn, 
that would mess up my structure, and I was worried that a6 would become a weakness. And again, this is not really in keeping with my strategy anyways of trying to open the position. Uh, I think even just knight takes a4 would be sufficient here. And now this pawn is guarded twice. Also, the b6 square is in white's possession. I could see knight b6 being a problem, maybe even queen b6. Also, it's very annoying that I can't play rook a b8 right now due to the bishop on f4. Maybe I could think about something like e5 and then rook a b8, but I didn't seriously consider b takes a4 in the game. It didn't seem like uh, playing in the spirit of the position for black. So I've got the two knights trying to keep the position more closed. I played b4, attacking the knight. And now she launches the knight to b5. So knight b5, first question we have to ask ourselves is why can't black just take this knight? And after a takes b5, a takes b5, note that white's rook on a1 is now showing its value. Discovered attack on the black queen, and also the knight on c6 is hanging. Now, I can sacrifice the queen or trade the queen for two rooks, but after white takes on c6 at the very end of this variation, I did not assess this position optimistically for black. Materially, black's doing fine. I have two rooks against the queen. We both have a set of minor pieces. But this pawn on c6 and even the pawn on c5 are going to be difficult to neutralize. And I think I'm likely to lose b4 as well. Now, backing up for a moment, when Camilla played h3, that was an important move to throw in because if she had ventured this idea without h3, so let's say a4 right here, b4, knight b5, well, now I have a stronger case to take on b5, trade on a1, because at the very end of this line, after b takes c6, same position as before, there's the small difference that I can play bishop e2, attacking f1, and I will win this bishop. So that was a detail that both of us noticed, and that's why she had to throw in h3 for this whole sequence to work. Uh, by the way, after h3, I could think about bishop h5, so trying to maintain the bishop e2 idea in the case that white goes a4 again. But I saw that g4 would always kick me back anyways, so I figured I should just play bishop f5 and maybe hope that the bishop is useful on this diagonal. So this was all played, and knight b5. And by the way... In this position, if you haven't already figured this out, uh, after b takes c6, here black does not have bishop d3 trying to win the bishop on f1 because white can just play queen takes d3. So on knight b5, I did not take the knight. I played e5 instead, so attacking the bishop on f4. She played knight d6, hopping in with the knight. This attacks the bishop on f5, so I think that's a decent in-between move. I wanted to preserve this bishop and also defend d5 a bit better, so I played bishop e6. There are some alternatives. Bishop takes h3 is a move that the engine, uh, I don't recall if it was completely thrilled about this, but it did mention as a possibility after the game. I can't recall if I considered this move too seriously at the time. This could be a trade if g takes h3, e takes f4, e takes f4. This is even material. White structure on the king side is kind of wrecked, but I also have this weak d5 pawn. There's also the possibility after bishop takes h3 of bishop g5 targeting my knight on f6. This is the line that the computer says is best. And then after black saves the bishop, white can take on f6 and then play e4 with the idea of swinging the queen over to the king side. And I may regret having shattered my king position a bit, even though white's down a pawn. So on knight d6, I decided to play just the bishop retreat. Bishop e6. Camilla retreated her bishop to h2. And round about here, I started using a lot of time. And we both get in mutual time pressure in this game. And this is the area of the game where um, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what to do. I wasn't quite sure how to play the position because, again, I'm, I don't want to open it entirely. I felt instinctively that opening the position would be in White's favor. She's playing very active now, and she still possesses that bishop pair along with the knight anchored on d6. But I didn't see how to play the position if not for opening it. So the first thing I did is play knight d7, trying to target the pawn on c5. The problem is knight takes c5 is not really a threat for black. And her next move surprised me. She played g4. This solves any back rank issue that white might have. It also gives the knight access to f5 if it needs to go there in the future, and allows for bishop g2. I think this might be one of the main ideas behind this move, trying to pressure the d5 pawn. I think it's a good move, pawn to g4. 
And I mentioned that knight takes c5 is not a threat because if I play this move, queen c2, and I've got two, two knights right in the line of fire. And if my knight on c5 moves again, she'll just play queen takes c6. So after g4, I begrudgingly played d4 opening lines because after thinking for a while, I just didn't really see anything better. I can't take the pawn on c5. It's hard to get my rooks involved. There's not really any targets. You know, maybe I could try to think about getting a rook to the C file, but C8 is covered by the white knight. I think I recall considering rook A7 for a little while with the idea of going rook C7, but it seems slow to me. Let's say she plays bishop G2 as planned, taking aim against the pawn on D5. I'm not sure I really have time for this maneuver. So I figured, all right, let's go for it. We're taking some risk opening the position, but the play is going to sharpen up. So far, white has the initiative. Maybe I can put her on her back foot. So I play d4 with a discovered attack on the queen on b3. Camilla played queen c2. I recall thinking that bishop c4 might also be played, but then knight takes c5 comes with tempo against the queen. So probably smart that she backed off the queen. And here I played bishop d5. So covering this long diagonal, hedging against white, putting the bishop on g2. And now bishop to c4. The move I was um, most afraid of here after bishop d5 was actually queen f5. I thought this could be nasty. Attacking the knight on d7. There's one major point is that if I try to defend that knight with, say, rook d8, there's knight b7, forking the queen and the rook. I could perhaps try to defend from a7 with the rook or move this knight away, but if I move the knight away, I believe bishop takes e5 could be an issue, just losing that pawn, which the knight on d7 was helping to defend, along with the knight on c6. So queen f5 was the move I was most fearful of here. Instead, she played bishop c4, offering a trade of the bishops. In here, I saw an idea, and again, I went for it. Like, in the spirit with d4, I think I have to plow forward at this point and hope for the best. So I played b3, advancing and attacking white's queen. She took the pawn, bishop takes b3. If queen takes b3, on the other hand, now I do get to play knight takes c5 since it comes with tempo on the white queen. And there's kind of a mess going on in the center, but I think black has sufficient play here. For instance, if white plays queen back to c2, knight b4 is another tempo move I can make, hitting the queen. So on b3, she played bishop takes b3. I jumped in, knight b4, tempo on the queen. And now queen d1. I believe at this point, the best move was queen d2. And this is a move that, you know, probably only a computer would seriously think about, especially with dwindling time. And I had less time than her at this point, but neither of us had a ton. So after queen to d2, the point is on bishop takes b3, white can win the piece back by playing knight to b7, hitting the queen on a5. And after the queen moves, white's going to pick up that knight on b4. Queen takes b4. So that's a nice tactical point that is probably going to remain hidden, uh, especially with both players nearing time pressure. So she played queen d1, just supporting the bishop further. Now I took on b3. She took back. And I took on c5. So I regain my pawn. I have two active knights. And I was optimistic at this point. She started consuming more time. It seemed to me that I had survived uh, the worst of it in the center. And maybe I could even look forward to um, you know, further confusing her in time pressure. So she played queen c4 here, hitting my knight on c5. I still can't use the c-file to ever support the knight, so I got to move it. I played knight cd3. And now Camilla made a great decision. I definitely think this is the best way of going about it what she played next. So white to move. If you were white, how would you react to black's last move, knight cd3? You can pause your video if you like. Okay, so here Camilla correctly sacrificed the exchange. In other words, she gave up a rook for a minor piece. That's what it means. You, we mean by sacking the exchange. So she played e takes d4. You can see that the rook doesn't have a lot of great options. c2 and c3 are covered. 
And if the rook goes to d1, that runs into knight takes b2, forking the queen and the rook. And I don't think any other square is really attractive for white. e1 is covered, so that's a no-go. So she's pretty much looking at either f1 or b1, neither of which white really wants to play when black is uh, increasingly active. So I think e takes d4 was a great decision, both practically and objectively. I take on c1. She takes back. And now we reach an, inter an interesting position. So I'm up a little bit of material. However, with my next move, I give away any potential advantage. And in fact, I could have been punished for this next move. And it's a very normal move. I just took the pawn on d4, which is attacked twice by white's pawn on d4 and the bishop on h2. But this could have led to a disaster if white had played properly from here. Now, funnily enough, I actually saw the move that is best for white, but I was doing a little bit of hope chess, and you know I'm guilty of it too. Sometimes you hope your opponent does not find the strongest move. Also, I was not enamored with the alternatives. The best move for, white, for black is e4 here, just advancing the e-pawn, but allowing white to play knight takes e4. I was not thrilled about that possi possibility because white would have two pawns for the exchange, so white wouldn't even be down any material. Though maybe now that I think about it, I can pick up this pawn on a4. So I think I showed a bit of lack of discipline here by taking on d4, even though I strongly suspected that white's next move was good. So you can see that even strong players are uh, victims to hope chess from time to time. But we're both under 10 minutes at this point. I figured there's a chance she might not find it. And also, I did harbor some hope that if she did find it, I would be able to figure out a way out, which in the... The cold light of computer analysis is not the case. <laughs> so she played queen takes d4, but the best move here for white, pause your video if you don't want to hear me say it, is knight f5. This is a vicious move. So directing the knight towards the black king. And the point is that white does not have to be in a huge hurry to win the pawn back on d4. So queen takes d4 is coming, whereupon there will be a mate threat on g7, and black just doesn't have a lot of good counter arguments here. It's difficult to support this pawn because if I play, for instance, rook a d8, I'm running into bishop c7. Double attack on the queen and the rook on d8. Also note that if I play queen d5, there's two issues. One, I lose the knight on b4. And the bigger issue, I allow knight e7 check with the fork, picking up the queen. So knight f5... A bit of delayed gratification, not taking the pawn on d4 yet, but directing the knight towards the black king would have been very tough to meet. You know, I was looking at a line like g6, knight h6 check, king g7, hoping to attack the knight and distract white from winning the d4 pawn. But white can just go full steam ahead, take on d4 check, and if king takes h6, bishop f4 is going to be mating very soon. g5, queen f6 checkmate. So knight f5, if I flick on the engine here, on lee chess, this would give white a roughly two and a half, almost three pawn advantage. Let me just explore this line. Queen b6, trying to support the pawn on d4. Yeah, again, this move, bishop to c7. Queen f6, black is persisting in defending d4, but I lose the knight here in the process. So in order to escape... A worse fate with my king, I'd have to give up some material, it seems, and yeah, this would not be good. So I think this was my weak point in the game. Uh, taking on d4, it's a tough move to resist, and you know, I, I could tell you that I just played this move because of time pressure, but it's not true. Like, I showed a lack of discipline here. I saw that white could play knight f5. I was just hoping it wouldn't be as strong as it, as it actually is, and I was hoping she wouldn't find it. Not a great decision. So instead, after e takes d4, Camilla played queen takes d4, and I breathed a bit of a sigh of relief. I continued rook a d8, so finally I get to include my rooks in the play. And rook a d8 is important because it stops knight f5. So after rook d8, she played a calm move, b3, just supporting the pawn on a4, which was attacked by the black queen. And I think the position here is one of dynamic equality. Nominally, black is up a point to material. I have a rook against her minor piece plus pawn. But it's hard to make use of it because white is coordinating better than I am, slightly. And it's mostly due to this knight on d6. Even though this knight can't go to f5, this does control a lot of territory. And I feel like my coordination is uh, not as good as white's. 
I've got something to prove there. The position is still messy, however. I played knight a2, attacking the rook. I think this is a good move. If the rook abandons the c-file, so let's say rook b1, I was thinking about playing knight c3, attacking b1, and threatening knight e2 check, fork on the king and the queen. Identical to that fork that I was showing in that other line for white, by the way, knight e7 check. So knight a2, Camilla played rook c6, so she plays the rook up the board, a solid move supporting the knight on d6, also keeping an eye on c3. The downside is that I get to play queen e1 check. So my queen swoops in, bothers her king, and I played this as a way to reposition my queen. King g2, I played queen e6. Now white is pinned laterally. She can't move the knight due to queen takes c6 check. I'm also hounding this pawn on b3. And I think we both had about five minutes at this point. I wish I had written down uh, some of the times during the game, which you can. A lot of players write on the score sheet how much time they have remaining and their opponent has remaining. I didn't do that, however, in this game. So during play at this point, the move that I was most worried about from her was queen c4. I thought this might be a good way for white to offer a queen trade and try to take the play into an end game where I'm not sure I can hold my pawn on a6. And so this seemed annoying. We just turn on the engine and see what it thinks about this. Queen takes c4, knight takes c4, rook a8. Yeah, black has to go passive in order to hold this pawn. Knight b6, rook back to d8, knight c4. Okay, so the computer is suggesting that a perpetual is the logical way to end this game. Not sure about that. But I guess if, if b takes c4 instead, I might have this saving move. Yeah, I have to keep this in mind because moving the knight back to b4 is a good way to attack the rook and also defend the pawn. So I think I probably would have mustered enough resources against queen c4 to avoid losing this endgame. But it's worth noting that even though you're down material, that doesn't mean you can't go into an endgame. If you have long-term advantages, like you know a pawn majority on a certain side of the board, and short-term advantages too, like one of your opponent's pawns is particularly weak, yeah, you could you could very legitimately play an end game down the exchange and have a better position. Just depends on what's going on. So fortunately for me, after queen e6, Camilla made a mistake. And this is an important moment in the game. So she played pawn b4. That pawn was attacked on b3, so it's natural for white to advance it. But now black to move. How should I continue? And you're going to need a series of moves. Pause your video if you like. So I played. Knight takes b4. And I saw this in advance. So when I played queen e6, I was hoping she would play b4, specifically because of this mini combination. So knight takes b4. And she, uh, she let out an audible gasp at this point. <laughs> so I can tell she didn't see this coming. Um, and I was starting to feel like I might have a chance to win this game. Queen takes b4, virtually forced. The rook is attacked, and she can't win a6. So queen takes b4. And now I play queen d5 check, forking the king and the rook. This compels white to play queen e4 to block, trying to defend both. And now the important point, rook takes d6, removing the defender of the queen on e4. So with this combination, I win a little bit of material back. Unfortunately, after queen takes d5, rook takes d5, white does win the pawn on a6 at the end of the variation. This is how the game continued. So even though knight takes b4 took my opponent by surprise and did result in a number of trades, and I got rid of that pesky knight on d6, it's debatable whether it really achieved all that much. I do think it's the best move, definitely. Like Otherwise, black is under pressure here. But... I was annoyed that this move like wasn't winning on the spot. <laughs> you know, not that I deserve it from this position, but uh, you always hope that when you take your opponent by surprise with a tactical move and time pressure that you're going to get something substantial out of it. But really, in this case, all we got was a transition to an endgame where I actually have difficulties neutralizing this white A pawn. So it's two rooks for black against rook and bishop for white. But white has this import important asset in the form of the A pawn. And whether I'm going to win this game is going to hinge on 
whether I can neutralize this or how big of a role that A pawn will play. So here I played F5. Normally you wouldn't want to trade too many pawns in a situation like this. I only have three pawns remaining and I'd like to keep some so I can play for a win. But I figured that the bigger factor was activating this rook on F8. I did not want white's A pawn to get up the board quickly. So I figured that F5 was the most efficient way to activate this rook. And I also had an eye towards attacking that pawn on F2. Camilla took on F5 now. And I played rook F takes F5. It seems more natural to play rook D takes F5. But with rook F takes F5, I had in mind playing rook A5. Offering a trade of rooks and also attacking the pawn on a4. So let's just say white plays some random move. I get to do this and I will win the pawn. So rook f takes f5 is going to demand a precise response from white. Now white to move. If you're playing white in this position, you're defending this end game, And you know black's threat. What would you play? Her next move is important. And when she played it, I had a feeling it was going to be really, really tough to win this. It's annoying to face this next move, especially in time pressure. So she played the excellent move bishop to c7, guarding the a5 square and supporting the pawn if it were to advance to a5. White's king is naked now, but with my rooks being so clumsily placed, I can't create any meaningful threats. So bishop c7 was an excellent move by my opponent. I think this move demonstrates her experience. She's probably played many endgames in her life. She's a women's grandmaster, former U.S. women's champion. She's been around the block a time or two, so she knows that keeping the A pawn is her best chance in this endgame. So here I played rook g5 check. Just trying to force the king away from guarding one of the pawns, at least. Camilla played king h2. Rook df5, attacking the pawn on f2. Bishop b6. So this is the maneuver she had in mind when she played bishop to c7, supporting the pawn on f2 and also supporting the advance of the a pawn. Here I think I missed a reasonable chance. I played rook f3, but I believe it would have been strongest to play rook g6. And these are the inaccuracies that creep in when you're in time pressure. You, just, you sometimes play second or third rate moves. So rook g6 would threaten rook takes f2. This is the detail I missed. If I got another move, let's say white plays uh, even a5, advancing the pawn, rook takes f2 is possible because on bishop takes f2, there's rook takes a6. Now I'm not sure after rook g6, rook a8 check, rook f8, rook takes f8 check, king takes f8, a5. I'm not sure if black can win this position. The a pawn is not super dangerous because I always have my rook to come over and help out in defense. So I can try to bring my king over, but white holds everything here. The bishop on b6 does a great job of holding both a5 and f2. These pawns are split for white, so that's a concern. But with black only having h and g pawns remaining, I don't know if I could win this position. But I do think trading a pair of rooks would have made the position a lot easier to play in time pressure. And in hindsight, I would have liked that scenario. So on bishop b6, I should have taken the opportunity to play rook g6 here. But instead, I went rook f3. My idea with this move was to try to target the h3 pawn, so I'm looking to play rook h5. But Camilla correctly abandoned the h pawn right now and just focused on pushing her main asset, the a pawn. So a5, I continued rook h5, rook a8 check, king f7. I'm not going to play rook f8 because, again, my, my goal is to win the h3 pawn. So king f8, and she just continued pushing the pawn, a6. I play rook f takes h3 check, king g2. Now the problem here is, even though I've gained a pawn on the king side, this a pawn is becoming an increasing nu nuisance. Uh, it's marching down the board very quickly. If it gets to a7, it'll be protected by the bishop and the rook, and I'll have to think constantly about white moving the rook away, for instance, to b8 or maybe even over to h8 to attack the h7 pawn, and then promoting on a8. So meanwhile, while I'm off kind of lollygagging over on the king side with my two rooks winning the h-pawn, white is advancing this pawn and creating some meaningful threats over the next couple moves. And that's why at this point I decided to give a series of checks. 
So I played rook h2 check, king f3, rook h3 check, king g2, rook h2 again. And I'm sorry to disappoint you, the viewers, but the game ended in a perpetual check. So we agreed to draw at this point after repeating a few times. Now, if I had seen that there was a, play, a way to play for a win, I would have gone for it. But having you know a minute or less on my clock, even though there is that 30-second increment, I didn't want to risk um, even potentially messing this position up and allowing that A-pawn to become truly dangerous. It's already dangerous, but as I pointed out, if white can go A7 and move the rook away, I have to reckon with A8 queen. So I did chicken out a little bit here, but I don't feel bad about this decision because I just did not see a good way to play for a win. So turns out I could have played rook a3 here, getting behind the pawn, and then after a7 played rook b5, attacking the bishop. And if white plays rook b8 now, trying to free up for a8 queen, I can play rook takes b6. And whichever way white plays this, rook takes b6 or a8 queen, I will emerge up a pawn in a rook end game. So if a8 queen, just rook takes a8, and then white can take either rook, let's say this one, it's two versus one over here. Black has winning chances in this position. I would definitely play this. Why not? Try my best to win. However, the thing I missed, I kept thinking that it was possible for white to like secure the bishop, for instance. So let's say play bishop e3 to start, or maybe bishop d4 even, if white wants to avoid this bishop being attacked by one of black's rooks. And I missed that after rook b a5, monitoring the pawn from behind, if white goes rook h8, looking to attack the h-pawn and uh, hoping for rook takes a7, bishop takes a7, rook takes h7, a7, rook takes h7, draw. Neither side is going to win this with just one pawn versus one pawn. The, the detail I miss is that after rook h8, white is not actually threatening anything uh, other than rook takes h7. So black could calmly play like king g6 here, just securing the h-pawn. And white cannot promote a8 queen because rook takes a8, rook takes a8, rook takes a8. So I wish in hindsight I would have seen that detail because I think I did briefly look at this idea of bringing both rooks over to defend the pawn on a7, but it escaped my attention that rook h8 could always be met calmly by like h6 or uh, king g6 just holding the pawns. So that's how the game ended, perpetual check. And I think it's a little risky for white to do anything but repeat the position. You know, she could try to wheel her king around, like king f1, rook h1, king e2. In this case, I would have to play rook a1, by the way, and get behind the pawn, or very nearly would have to do this, and it could be similar. So from her point of view, I think she was very happy with the draw, uh, especially having been surprised by that knight takes b4 move a little while ago. So we split the point in this game. Very interesting game. I think both players played accurately uh, when I went back and through and looked at it with the engine and with the Lee Chess engine, which tells you the inaccuracies and mistakes and blunders. We both had a fairly low average centipon loss. Just kind of recapping a few things. I'm not sure if I could have played the opening a whole lot better. Like I suspect there's some way right around here I could have improved. Maybe that bishop takes e2 move that the engine was alluding to. It's hard for me to believe that any of these moves are like a big mistake, but the computer does start to give an edge for white around the time that I go for this knight b4, b5 idea. White gains the bishop pair and even has a4, knight b5 in mind, as in the game. There are some cool tactical complications. I think this position is difficult to play for black. She put me under a lot of pressure. It's hard to ever win the c5 pawn. And I made some decisions that at the time I knew were risky. Like, you know, even this d4 move, opening the position, uh, bishop f, bishop d5, I saw that queen f5 could be pesky. But I almost felt like they were born out of necessity in the position. Right around here, I was feeling the most confident in the game, and she made the excellent decision to sacrifice the exchange. Still not happy that I played e takes d4 here. I think if I want to reach that next level in my game, I have to be willing to play moves that um, are not the most fun to play, like e4 giving the pawn back but are necessary in the position. You can't play hope chess. In e takes d4, I was guilty of playing hope chess, allowing knight f5, which would have been tremendous for white, plus three advantage according to the computer. 
I think my play after this was decent, but in time pressure, mutual time pressure, even though I found Knight takes B4, it was still tough to win this endgame. I have a feeling this endgame is a draw if both sides play perfectly. But that doesn't mean it'll be necessarily drawn in practice. I think there's a lot of ways, if black plays accurately, that black can put pressure on white from here. Like at this moment, I had that rook g6 idea, which ultimately would have led to a pair of rooks being swapped off due to the threat of rook takes f2. White has to play this, and then here, white's bishop is under fire, so they have to trade and then play a5. And I might have to grind out an endgame win from here or attempt to, but this would have been a better chance than what I got in the game. All right, so I was on two and a half out of three after this draw. And in the next game, uh, just a little preview, I was paired with Camilla Bagenskite's husband, Grandmaster Alex Yermolinsky, an extremely strong player who I played several times in the past. And that game was particularly interesting, so I will try to analyze it soon on the channel. Anyways, thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments, and I will talk to you guys later. Bye.